So let's get started. And uh, I haven't heard the bell ring yet, but I don't know if that's going on at this time. Anyway, uh, so uh, this is it. This is the last day of the conference. Soon be going home. Uh, feeling kind of sad to leave here. Uh, it's been a, a great week. Uh, so was anyone at um, um, the talk, talk I did yesterday? No, great. So no overlapping audiences, uh, which means I'll be making new acquaintances. Um, right. So this is... Um, Kind of a mysterious title, but I will explain in a moment. Uh, the Leprechauns of Software Engineering. So, who's a software engineer? Not so very many of you. All right. So, maybe this is kind of superfluous. Uh, but still, a lot of what we do in software development um, is seen as belonging to that particular discipline, software engineering. And uh, many of the things we talk about in the Agile community uh, take place within the context of a debate which started uh, in the late 60s, um, 1968 was the date when people came up with this notion that there is, uh, there is such a thing as software. Uh, there are some disciplines concerned with the engineering of various things. So why not apply the notion of engineering to software? And thus was born software engineering. That was not something which came naturally. Uh, initially, the phrase software engineering was seen as provocative. That's another talk, uh, one I've given before on the history of software engineering and the, the continuity between the history of software engineering and that of Agile. But I wanted to briefly uh, bring some of that background to this talk. Uh, now, a different kind of history. When I was a kid, I used to read the comics. Uh, any of you remember that? You know the kiddie books and comic comics that you read as a kid. Uh, and it was not all, you know, it was not all adventure comics or uh, funny comics. There were also uh, things of a more um, educational interest. And one of the things I used to like a lot uh, was the did you know section. So I don't know if, if that rings a bell for you, uh, but uh, interesting factoids, things about the world that may um, uh, waken the curiosity of a young person. And uh, you know, one of the things I came across was this uh, notion that we only use 10% of our brains. So, so did you know scientists have shown that people use only 10% of their brains? Uh, another fun one was, uh, did you know the, the Great Wall of China is the only man-made structure that you can see from space? Uh, actually, this has you know, kind of inspired other vocations. Uh, but uh, the... the Key thing, of course, uh, about those two things, facts, so-called, is that they are not actually facts. N neither of them is actually true. Uh, we don't know enough about neuroscience to be even able to make such statements as uh, how much of our brain we actually use. We, we use all of it. The brain is kind of a holographic thing. Uh, so that statement doesn't really make sense. It was probably derived and distorted from uh, something that somebody said at some point, which transformed into something else. Um, the same goes for the, the story about the Great Wall of China. There are many uh, man-made structures that you can see from space if you interpret space 
has a certain altitude and there you can see nothing if you go high enough right so that's you know the, the, the kind of thing uh, I used to to be tricked into believing and then uh, found out much to my uh, annoyance um, embarrassment were not actually true so great uh, resource if at any point in your life, because that, that to my, again, to my uh, disappointment and surprise, I keep learning that some things I believe are false, even at the old age, well, at the middle age of 40. Uh, so I periodic periodically check something up on Snopes.com, uh, which is a site devoted to debunking uh, urban myths. So, <laughs> what's interesting is that I think we need a snopes.com for uh, things in software engineering. So, things that people will tell you, uh, but which in fact turn out not to be true. So, I'm going to be telling you today about things I have come to call leprechauns. Um, why leprechauns? I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but I want to start with a concrete example. So, isn't this something we would all like to know? Where do bugs come from? And I advanced uh, a theory, a hypothesis about that yesterday in my other talk, which was that bugs in the source code uh, tend to come from bugs in the human brain, those we call cognitive biases. Uh, but <laughs> there is a different uh, kind of explanation which uh, goes around for um, and has been uh, kinking, kinking around for uh, many years now in the software engineering community. Uh, and it goes something like this. You can probably uh, use Google to find a, a very close approximation to that quote. 56% uh, 50, of all bugs identified in, in projects across the whole industry uh, originate in the requirements phase. That's something I've read time and again. Um, so, of course, the thing to remember is that this is folklore, it's myth, it's not fact. And actually, it cannot even be fact. It's not possible for this to be a fact. But I will, I will come back to that. Now, I'll tell you the results of that investigation, but I think when, when you come across something like that, which is a sweeping generalization, which has a number in it, so that would seem to indicate that some kind of research was uh, done at one point, and, and that is you know, kind of an, an aggregate result from many projects. Uh, so you would think there were studies, and uh, uh, several of these studies were summarized into that one number. So, um, a very useful and healthy thing to do when you come across such a claim uh, is uh, something that has been encapsulated uh, in the Wikipedia community as citation needed. That's the phrase they use. And there, there is this very nice uh, illustration from the comic uh, XKCD. If you don't read XKCD, uh, you might find it interesting. Uh, funny, at times funny in a tragic sort of way. So he's, he's someone who really gets uh, what it is to be a geek. Um, and so he's got geek leak all over uh, his work. Uh, so politicians are very prone to that kind of thing. They will say something with uh, poise, assurance. Uh, I, I say that. Jobs in this country are being destroyed because of blah, blah, blah. And uh, nobody uh, usually thinks to ask them in, you know, in, in uh, the moment, wait, how do you know that? Do you have proof? Do you have evidence? So that, that's the kind of thing that the uh, XKCD author is dreaming about. Someone waving a, a placard saying, where is your evidence? Give us a citation. 
But the more disturbing thing, I think, about the 56% uh, claim is uh, when, when I personally uh, express disagreement with those kind of things. I tend to get a response uh, which goes someone li something like this. So, so I made the, the claim starker, more clearly false, so that you can see the, the logic. Uh, so say someone is telling me 56% uh, of all bugs in our programs are uh, in fact introduced by a leprechaun called Murphy. And you know, sometimes it feels a little like that. Where, where did this bug come from? Uh, certainly not from me. It worked on my machine. Um, so, so this may even feel like a, a correct explanation for bugs. They, they are introduced into our source code by gremlins or leprechauns or something like that. But then, of course, you know, you, we wake up and no, no, clearly that's that's not the case. So, you know, you would you would raise your hand and say, "What? No, this is uh, this is a false claim." And then. The person you're talking to says, oh, you think, you think it's false, so, so you think it's more than 56% that comes from leprechauns, or maybe less than 56%. And of course, the answer to that is, no, it's not the number that matters. It's, there are no such thing as leprechauns, right? So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's the analogy that came to mind when I had this kind of discussion, uh, and that's the reason I coined the term leprechauns. So I, I had I used this uh, skeptical thinking reflex uh, when I was confront, confronted with that claim that 56% of all bugs come from the requirements phase. Uh, this is this is not just you know. Uh, something that people say which doesn't matter. It's, uh, it's actually, uh, it turns out to be a pretty big deal because if you think about it, the justification for the waterfall cycle initially was that because there, there were two things which kind of uh, underpinned the waterfall cycle. One of them was, I will come back to that, uh, if you don't catch a mistake in the requirements, it's going to cost you a lot more to fix it later when you get to the coding phase. And the other was most of the mistakes, in fact, come from requirements. So if you were convinced of those things, you would be very well justified. It would be a smart conclusion to come to that we must take requirements work very seriously. We must invest most of our effort there. And, and certainly not rush to programming. Right? So do, the, uh, do a lot of work upfront in the upfront phase because studies have shown, you know, researchers tell us, well, people tell us that researchers say that's where the mistakes happen, and, uh, and that's when it's cheapest to fix. So that's, that's a, a legitimate conclusion if the premise is true. And because it's so important, it's important to check where that comes from. So where is the evidence? Where is the original, original study? So I started digging around using the citation needed reflex. And it turns out that most of the people who are currently saying this are referencing someone else. So there, there, there are some citations, but there are usually citations to someone who's citing someone else again. So what do you do? As good programmers, you recurse, right? So you want, you want to see where that thing bottoms out. So you go looking for the citations uh, that, that you go up the chain of citations and you find someone who says one study by uh, James Martin showed that so it's no longer uh, you know it's it's not oh uh, many researchers have worked on this and come up with that 
one number as a summary. It's one person, James Martin, in one book. But that at least has the benefit of narrowing things down. So you go and try to get that book. It's not easy because it's uh, out of print for decades. Uh, it's a book called, um, uh, ah, I forget the exact title. Um, it's a, a, a book from the 60s, I think, by James Martin. And uh, the nice thing now is you can actually order uh, used books on, Am on Amazon, and you can get them for very cheap uh, because they are used library books which are returned to circulation uh, through Amazon Marketplace by booksellers. So it's, it's books that libraries are getting rid of, basically. So I got this one for, uh, I think, two euros. And uh, so I'm riffing through the pages, trying to find the source of this uh, observation. How many studies, how many scientists uh, were involved? How many projects? How many do you think? What do you think was the sample size, to use a technical term, for that study which showed that 56% of all Bugs in projects come from requirements. A guess. Of course, so this is a statistical result. So the bigger the sample size, the more convincing this should be. Any guess? So 10, OK. That if, if you came across a study that said, we studied 10 projects and we came to that conclusion, would you think it very convincing? No. Not a lot. How many would it take to convince you? Something in the hundreds, maybe. Yeah, that's. I don't know why, because uh, it depends on so many other things. Uh, but uh, we would probably tend to be more convinced if someone com came and told us uh, we studied a hundred projects across many different kinds of enterprises, and this is what came out. But actually, uh, I'll spare you the hunt for the exact detail, uh, the sample size was one. So it's this one company that James Martin was working with. It's uh, a bank. Uh, and, and it's, uh, I mean, he's not a scientist. He's a consultant. So that very widely cited figure of 56% turns out to be almost, not, you know, not quite, but almost made up. And yet, it's used as a critical justification for many things in software engineering. Mm. So we, we are going to keep, uh, we're going to keep track of Murphy. Uh, and uh, this is kind of a, you know, I'm just taking you on a tour. So I'm, I'm, we only have a short span of time, so I can only give you a few highlights. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time at the end to uh, take questions. So be aware that there are more sites to see on this uh, exploration of um, leprechauns in software engineering. I'm just giving you some highlights. The cost of change. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, Ken Beck's book on extreme programming? A few. So you, you will remember this. That's the famous uh, fabled cost of change curve. So now the interesting thing in extreme programming, uh, in, in, in the theory of extreme programming, is the claim that extreme programming flattens the cost of change curve. But I'm not going to talk about that. I just want to focus on this and where it came from. So what this says, if you, if you look at the curve in terms of what does it mean? Uh, so what's on the bottom? The, the phases of the life cycle. So it's the one thing to notice is the curve is smooth. It's continuous, as if the bottom axis was something more uh, continuous like time. But you know, it's actually a discrete curve. Uh, and the y-axis is a cost. So the unit would be what? Money. Money. Cost. Money. Cost. Money. 
money, except, except of course, that in, in the software business, we don't count cost in terms of money most of the time. We right. So, you know, that's already something that uh, they're, they're we, could, we would be interested in finding the details uh, when this was measured, right? Because this is a graph, so it's uh, probably something that came out of some studies. Uh, it would be interesting to see if the, the data points were come, came from hours or dollars or some other unit. But so those are just a few of the questions that might pop into your head when you see something like that. Now, Beck says uh, in his book, he's very honest. He says, I drew this from memory and from memory of my university days. So I got this from the teacher. Uh, and you know, maybe I'm not drawing it quite right, but you get the, the general idea, which is that it costs more to make a change in a software project as time or you know, kind of a surrogate of time, which is the, the phases of the life cycle, goes on. So that's where, that's where I first came across that curve, because I'm a fairly young developer. Some of the people who have been around for longer uh, probably saw it originally in a different form. So I'm just going to show you the oldest form of that curve. And, and you notice the difference? This one is linear, whereas, sorry, the previous one was a, an exponential. But of course, this is a, a log graph, which is why. So linear corresponds to uh, a log curve when you, well, I mean, uh, a linear slope on a log graph corresponds to an exponential. Uh, so this one is more interesting because you can see there are, there are uh, error bars. So that's, that's good, right? You, it's uh, a scientist being honest. We measured, but you know, we are giving you a kind of a summary of those measurements and, and there is some uncertainty. So we saw measurements that ranged from this to that. But yeah, overall, it seems to be a very a fairly nice fit. So the, the originator of that uh, curve uh, is Barry Beam. But there you, you probably notice another difference. Anyone spot that? So this is not the cost of change curve. This, is, this does not talk about, right. So it, this one is about fixing defects. So 1976, what Beam was saying then, was something slightly different, or maybe significantly different, depends on how you interpret that, uh, from what Beck was saying uh, in 2000. So the original finding was, uh, if, you, if, you take, uh, so if you take, uh, if you divide the cost, so I, we suppose it's the average cost to fix a bug uh, when you detect it here. And you compare it to the cost to fix the same bug when you detect it earlier in, in the design phase. Uh, you get a ratio. So that, that curve is a curve. Uh, it's a, a plot of ratios. So that's why it's a rela relative cost to fix curve. Uh, and you, you see this everywhere. I mean, uh, there are tens and maybe hundreds of citations of that uh, finding in various forms. So this is one of the more uh, uh, exotic forms. It's the pyramid interpretation of the cost to fix curve. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's a little like the foot pyramid. So it's 20 years after the original uh, finding. Uh, and this one is uh, even more elaborate. Uh, so that's, it's something that, that was uh, published by the US Federal Highway Administration in 2007. And, and they say it's inspired by Steve McConnell 
who has uh, done a, a lot of work to popularize some important ideas uh, in software engineering, and in particular, some ideas from BIM. Uh, and, and what this one shows, I think it's interesting for that reason. Uh, it uh, kind of gives you a matrix between when the error was introduced and when it was detected. So of course, uh, if, you, if you introduce an error in the coding phase, it doesn't quite have time to, to uh, blow up exponentially, but if you uh, introduce a defect in the requirements phase, then it has time to go and, and blow up to uh, more than 100 times the cost to fix originally in defects. Yes? So, is the defect that you are meaning is related to requirements or is it related to the outcome of the functionality? That's, so that's an excellent question. Where your actual functionality comes from. That's an excellent question. So, so, you guys know bugs, right? And you know that bugs come in all sorts of varieties and you know, and, and you, you know that there is a lot of, ha have any of you uh, have that happen, that you spend uh, one hour, maybe two hours, maybe days, arguing with the customer whether something was a bug or not a bug? Has that ever happened to you? Right, so, so and we tend to do that for many things. So it's not just once in the course of a project, right? It's a, it's a recurring discussion. We spend a lot of time arguing about those things. And, um, but the scientists who studied that, right, they must have, uh, have a, uh, had a clear sense of what was and what wasn't a bug. Right? Otherwise, they couldn't do that research. One more question. So is this study based on uh, classic projects where things happen linearly or also for iterative development? So that there's an interesting debate about that because the original research was in the 70s. Uh, there were no agile projects back, well, they were not uh, talked about much anyway. And so the model that most people would have in mind, and anyway, the way that the curve is framed, uh, suggests that the projects that they studied were uh, waterfall type projects. But what's more interesting is, uh, uh, you know, so you come across the curve itself, and if you have the citation needed reflex, you're going to check the data. So we want to, what you want to say is, show me the numbers. Where are the numbers? Raw numbers, right? So this is, um, do you think this is the same graph? <laughs> I see some of you squinting. So it doesn't quite jump out at you. But this is one of the graphs from a paper by Beam published a few years later, which looked in more detail at exactly the same project that this curve purports to describe. Uh, the one, so, so TRW survey, I don't know if you can read that, the, the black dots, those points are supposed to come from this data, more or less. Or rather, it's not quite clear because there are two different papers, so uh, it's an inference on my part that they were referring to the same project. But there is a lot of text in, in addition to the pictures which describes where he uh, got the data from. And so th those are actually um, students. So there were students that Barry Beam was teaching, and he uh, took some measurements of how long it took them to do various kinds of work. So my question to you is, do you see an exponential curve here? Neither do I. So that's, you know, I, I came across this paper, and it's uh, a lot of research to find them. Uh, and I was, you know, hoping to see the data that corresponded to an exponential rise. You know, maybe not exactly, maybe you could see some error bars, but I was not expecting to see that, you know, which is, you know, just kind of ups and downs. And uh, so, but that's not the only uh, series of data points in, in the curve. There were others. So, again, you go look for uh, 
any time that the, the curve is uh, used in a serious book, uh, you will usually see a lot of citations. Right? And so you can follow the chain of citations back to the source. And one of the more serious uh, sources that I came across was this fairly recent paper um, referring to studies that use aircraft, so also a very, a very uh, serious software installation. It's not your uh, you know, rinky-dinky startup uh, where you could always say, yeah, but you know, these guys, uh, they're not very disciplined, so maybe what they do is not representative. No, this is a, this is a big corporation. Okay. So, uh, and, and this is interesting because it's the most detailed uh, account of the raw data that I could find. So, probably the best in terms of quality of the original data. And there may be all sorts of problems doing the measurements, and that's also part of my uh, issue with the, the whole thing, but at least you, you have numbers. So, you can check whether the numbers tell the same story that the curve. Now, I'm not going to ask you to, to infer that from just looking at the numbers. I'm going to show you the curve, but it's not in the paper. It's a curve that I made using Google Spreadsheet. No, same question as before. Do you see an exponential there? No, it's actually cheaper, according to Hughes Aircraft, to fix a defect in maintenance than it is in functional testing. Contrary to what you know, received wisdom and everyone who cites the curve is saying. Um, and, and so it's actually more expensive to fix a defect in the architecture phase than it is in the design phase. So, no, that's, that's not the same story. But I, I've only plotted here one data series. Uh, if you remember, the, I can show you the, the original data. So it's the same matrix that we saw for, for the, uh, from the Federal Highway uh, graphs. So they, they are actually uh, tracing the cost of requirements based on when it was introduced and when it was uh, uh, detected. You might ask, how do they know that a defect was introduced in requirements? I don't know. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, observation. Uh, so let me, let me uh, first show you what, the, you know, what the source data said, and we'll come back to this question of personal experience and what we all know. Um, so here again, so this is from the other data series. Uh, and to be frank, to be uh, honest, I have to admit that at least one uh, series does seem to fit more or less an exponential curve, and that's the red. So it actually goes off the chart at the top. Uh, but it's the only uh, data series that does that. So if you look at the other ones, which uh, so, so that's for the uh, earliest defects, the one introduced in requirements, that's the cost of fixing them according to when they are detected. And the red is uh, the defects introduced in architecture. That's the cost of fixing them according to when you detect. And the same for design and code and so on. Right? So there is one which is an exponential. And the other ones are, well, we can see that it's more expensive a little uh, in the later phases. But we, d we don't see this exponential, the nice, smoothly rising exponential that everyone is talking about. Right, so, so my conclusion was that I'd been more or less taken for a ride, uh, tricked into believing something which is, at, at the very least, in the best interpretation, uh, the, the traditional curve is a lot stronger in what it says than the actual data. And you, can, you could probably say that there are many problems in interpreting the actual data, because what's a bug? How do you measure the cost? All of these things are hard, so I would expect to see much more than one study before I came to believe an exponential curve. 
So just to, to uh, boil this down to a, a couple takeaways for you, uh, don't just demand citations. Don't just say, oh, if you show me a citation, I, I will believe. And if you don't, I won't believe. It's interesting to actually read what people are citing and make, you know, make your own decision as to whether that is convincing or not convincing. And especially when what people are showing you is a, a, a chart, a histogram or a curve, what's interesting is not just the overall shape or the conclusions, but where did you get this data point? What did you measure to get this? What does it mean? Because here is studying uh, students, and maybe they do different things at different stages of the project. So maybe the way you measure a cost is not the same in requirements as it is in design and testing. So are these costs even comparable with each other? I don't know. We need more science. Uh, I'll, I'll go quickly over this one because I think it's also interesting. It's been used uh, as an argument for Agile. The cone of uncertainty, that's also from uh, McConnell. Uh, this is a modern representation. This is something you, you would see today in a blog, for instance. Notice it's the same, uh, it's the same timeline. It references the uh, life cycle phases. Um, and there is a variant which says uh, the best you can do is your initial estimates would be uh, between four times and a quarter what the uh, project eventually costs. Uh, but that's the best you can do. That's if you have very good practices in place. And actually, your estimate will remain fuzzy until the very end of the project if you don't have good practices. Um, so that's the idea that good practices kind of shrink the cone. Do you see a problem with the cone as it is currently shown? Do you think, so, so what this says in terms of numbers is you compare, it's also a ratio, you compare how long the project actually took, so that's what you know at the end of the project when you ship, with your initial estimate. And what you find is that your initial estimate may be as much as four times what the project actually took, or it may, it may be as little as one quarter, right? So you could be, you could be very uh, optimistic or very pessimistic in your initial estimate. And that's symmetrical, yes? So let me ask you, uh, how many of you have had a project when you were early by a factor of, let me just, two-thirds. One person? Okay, how many of you were, I don't need to ask that, right, then, because nobody was early by a factor of four, right? How many of you were on projects which were late by a factor of at least 20%? Right. Late that by more than 50%? Some of you. Anyone, anyone had uh, worked on a project where they were late, late by more than two? Twice the original estimate? Okay, so right now uh, we have a, uh, it's maybe an unrepresentative sample, but you don't fit the cone, right? So why? Uh, where did the original data come from? And, and why is it that when, when we poll uh, smallish but Still, you might be more or less representative. So I looked for the data. And interestingly enough, that, that was a short search because there is no data. This is the quote I found in Barry Beam's book, Software Engineering Economics, a hugely influential book. And he says about the graph that is that came to be known as the cone of uncertainty, these ranges have been determined subjectively you know what that word means? It means I made it up. <laughs> well, based on experience. So we come back to that thing about experience. Uh, isn't it the case that we know from experience and common sense that it, it costs more to fix a defect later? 
sure, I could give you a dozen arguments why it's so. But then again, if you think about, um, we use 10% of our brains. We all know people you know, where that make us go, oh yeah, this guy, he's using 10% of his brain, right? Don't tell me you haven't ever thought that about someone around you, maybe higher up than you, I don't know. But so, so many things which are convincing from a, a personal experience point of view turned out to have no substantial basis. And actually, there are many bugs which, which even when you detect them very late in the process, there are one minute fixes, very quick, very quick to fix, very quick to deploy. But what happens to those? You forget about them, right? Because they were so easy. What stands out in your mind, that's a kind of bias, availability bias, which is for exactly the same reasons that many people fear flying in a plane and they think they're going to die if they ever set foot in a plane and so they drive to uh, wherever they go on vacation and they drive to work even though they're about, I don't know, how many, 50 times as likely to die in a car as in a plane. But that's availability bias, right? Because you've heard about the plane crash. It doesn't even have to be 9-11. Every time there is a plane crash, people get scared and they prefer to drive instead and more people die. That's the way we are, we are wired. So just to end that section on a positive note, you could get empirical about the uh, uncertainties in a, in, in a project. So this is something from one team, and they are measuring, this is a burn down chart. They are measuring how close they, get, they are getting to done. And there, you know, th there is some uncertainty because there is the uh, strict extrapolation of that curve, but it could be better to use an average of the previous velocities or you could try to uh, average the past three velocities. So that's where the uncertainty comes from. Do you notice a difference between that and the cone? Another significant graphical difference? They're not oriented the same way. So it's interesting that this one is called the, co the cone of uncertainty, but it, it shows, it, it, what it says is basically the future gets more certain as we go toward it which is kind of a strange way to say it. I think this is more convincing. This is, we know the past and the present, but as we, as we move along to the right of that graph, our range widens. That, I just want you to think about that. So this is, this is an, an empirical measurement. This is from a, a, a paper in IEEE software, which was very critical of the cone of uncertainty and said we actually did measurements in, our, in, a, in a company and we measured uh, estimates given at various points and we compared them to how long the project actually took and we ended up with something like this which is uh, that you know I, I'm much more convinced by that because it has the right asymmetry we are optimistic most of the time not pessimistic about project duration that's that's more like it, you know, that's, that's better data, but it took researchers to become, uh, it took res researchers who became critical of the cone, who became skeptical, and they went actually looking for the data, and they found something that doesn't really fit a cone, uh, and maybe there's a lot of follow-up research to do on that, you know, wh why is that area more or less empty, and it's, it's, it's kind of strange the way this uh, plot uh, looks, so it makes me want to ask more questions rather than feel, you know, okay, the matter has been settled. Uh, even though the message of the cone is something I agree with, which is don't try at the day one of the project to have a very precise estimate because most of the time you'll be way off. But you're not going to be way off in the way that the cone says. Uh, a final one. Oh, well, so... Takeaways. Uh, you know they're saying one picture is worth a thousand words. So you must keep in mind that it goes both ways. It's much easier, it's a thousand times easier to lie with a picture than it is to lie with words. 
So when you come across a picture, you have to ask yourself, what a, a chart or a curve or a histogram, what does that mean? How did they measure what they claim to have measured? Is that measurement even possible? Right? Is it even possible to measure the average cost of fixing a bug? Given the variety of things we call bug, and given the amount of time we spend arguing about whether it's a bug or something else. I don't think it's possible. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think, and I have the same trouble with productivity. Any study you come across that claims to have measured the effect of something on productivity, to me the question that comes to mind immediately is, what do you mean by productivity? Because do, do you count the people who are actually, uh, do you count the hotshot programmer who, who writes a, th a thousand lines of code in a day, but then you have to spend weeks in the rest of the project for the rest of the team debugging his mess. But you know, because, because he's been hugely productive and the managers, and he, he kind of saved uh, uh, the project in the client's eye because he wrote that feature that the client was expecting in one uh, day. And the client was hugely impressed. The only, well, it doesn't quite work, but you know, well, there are just a few bugs, we'll fix them. Is that guy productive? I don't know. I, what does that word even mean? Right, so, so it's, it's really key to think about the meaning of those terms. Uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, Hyperproductive Scrum. That's an interesting one because it's closer to home, right? It's, uh, so it's not a software engineering, it's not a traditional software engineering, engineering uh, leprechaun. It's an agile leprechaun. Oh my. <laughs> what do you, we have those two? Yes. We have. So this is from uh, Control Chaos. It's one of the uh, founding papers in, in Scrum. Scrum methodology, similar to the iterative methodology, but assuming that all requirements are not known in advance, which is a good assumption. I approve of that assumption. Where I have a problem is with the, uh, almost the next sentence. I just snipped a bit which was not relevant. Productivity gains of 600% have been seen repeatedly in well-executed projects. So it's not just one anecdotal evidence. It's, uh, we've seen this repeatedly and on average uh, six times as fast, six times as productive. And not just, you know, uh, it's not just us saying that. It's not the Scrum people saying that. It's Capers Jones. Have you guys heard of Capers Jones? He's a, uh, so maybe not, and maybe you're lucky because uh, I'm not sure he's quite as relevant today uh, as he used to be, a little like Barry Beam. So they're, 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 those guys are academics. Um, but he was hugely influential in academic software engineering. It, it was, those guys are like the, the popes and cardinals of software engineering. So, so, well, so there are two things that you might be convinced by. The, the number, six times, that's good. Repeatedly, so it's not anecdotal. And there is an authority backing that. Wow, let's do Scrum. Can't escape that conclusion. Scrum is the smart thing to do. If you do anything other than Scrum, then uh, you're likely responsible for a failure to get six times productivity you're going to get fired. And it's not just the Scrum people saying so, it's uh, one of the cardinals of software engineering. Ha! Huh. I asked exactly the same question, but I'm glad you asked. <laughs> well, Capers Jones is still alive, so I emailed him. <laughs> I couldn't find a source, I couldn't find a source in the literature, so I sent Capers Jones an email and said, hey, uh, you don't know me, I'm just this guy, I'm, uh, you're the cardinal, I'm just a random... Actually, he's very sweet, he's a very sweet person. Uh, so he took the time to write back to me. Uh, he, he sent me tons of documents about... He's, uh, he's the Pope of function points. I don't know if you've heard of function points. Uh, he's the guy who invented them, basically. Uh, so he sent me tons of documents about function points, and he said, you should learn about function points. But he was really sweet. 
Uh, and that's what he told me. I don't remember that quote attributed to me. <laughs> I almost certainly did not assert that Agile had 600 gain, person gains because no methods have ever done that. And I have looked at many. <laughs> what? Say again? Uh, but no, I was not actually surprised by that point, by that point because uh, I was in the process of uh, writing up my findings. I'll get to that in a minute. So leprechauns, you find them everywhere. Right? So beware, beware the agile leprechauns. Uh, I, like, I like this quote by Twain. It's, it's not what you don't know that's going to kill you and your project. It's what you know absolutely with total certainty, but it's just, it just not true. So it's like, uh, have you seen those uh, funny videos of people bumping into a glass door? Uh, there's nothing there. So I can just walk straight, boom, oh. So that's what kills you, right? It's, it's the things you think are true, which just aren't. So, so <laughs> if you had to take one key message, of course, from this, it's think for yourselves. That's, don't have, have a, a reflex of doubt whenever you can, even, so what I like, some of my readers are great. Uh, I've written this uh, up in a book called The Leprechauns of Software Engineering, so you can get more, uh, lots more detail about uh, a bunch of other things, but uh, you know, I really wanted to, to take the time to dissect a few examples for you. Uh, I have great readers. They write back to me and said, uh, in chapter uh, three, you say this and that. Uh, can you clarify for me where you got that? I'm not sure if it's true. Ah, you've got it. So even, even what I tell you, you might want to check. So I've tried to make my arguments easy to check by including all the references, making sure that, there are, that you know where you can get the papers. Because some people will cite, they will cite a, a book or a paper at you, and it's an out-of-print book, or it's a paper that you have to pay $30 from, uh, uh, to IEEE to get. That's not easy to check. I know that, I know that it's a difficult proposition to be skeptical. I have encountered that in practice time and again. Uh, it's as if someone has decided that all the knowledge in the world must be locked away, you know, behind the paywall, just in case. No, knowledge is the dangerous thing, right? So it, it wouldn't do for all these people out there, all those practitioners to have too easy an access to all the works of researchers, academics. They've worked so hard on this. Why should it be easy for you to get, right? But that, you know, that's not the way progress is made. Science, progress is a matter of disseminating knowledge so that you can be skeptical but you can also have justified belief in the things that it's correct and legitimate to believe. So most of the time you will be able to find links to PDFs and can get them on the, you know, more or less legally. Um, and that's about it. Thank you all. I notice we have time for questions. I just have a question. So would you please just show one of these slides from the burn down charges just to estimate with one of the parameters? So what is it, what were the parameters taken for the test case today? Because that was based on your experience. So that was not one of mine. It's uh, something I uh, grabbed from the web from a team uh, that was uh, measuring their scrum, which I, you know, that's a good idea. You can, you can uh, probably learn a lot from uh, taking a scientific mi mindset approach with respect to your own project. At least you can validate the data. Uh, so it's a, it's a burn down, right? So part of it is in the past. How many points did we have left in scope? It's not a very good burn down either. Uh, it's one of those that start out flat, and then, ooh, there's a dip. As people start to complete 
uh, user stories. Maybe they're doing too many things in parallel. Um, but w w what I found interesting in this one was the, in the inversion. Uh, on it's, it's kind of flipped around. So they used, uh, uh, I don't know what best estimate is. So is it in relation to how uh, accurate the teams are in relation to what they estimated? And is it over yes. one iteration or one or more iteration? You have to be careful with uh, measurements of estimate accuracy. Uh, Linda had a great talk where she told us all we needed to know about why you cannot really estimate. So at best, it, it's something that gives you a way to think more closely about your project, but it's not a crystal ball. So, and and uh, part of our cognitive biases, uh, we are very bad at dealing with predictions and probabilities. So this is not, you know, this is not going to be published in academia. It's, it's a, a very low level tactical tool for one team, but they're trying to be honest about their uncertainty. That's, what I, that's why I liked and included this graph. But they're not, this is not, I don't mean to uh, say anything mean about the people who, who are behind it, but this graph is not honest. It's a, it's a caricature of reality. And it's not meant, it's not even meant to have you think about reality. On the contrary, it is meant to discourage conversation. It is meant as a weapon against managers when they ask for estimates. So instead of having a conversation about why, so if, if, if I could give you an estimate, what would you do with it? And is there some other way that we can satisfy uh, uh, your concerns or allay your concerns and so on? And so that's, that's a good conversation to have. Instead, what I used to do, I was, you know, I was taken for a ride. I was tricked. What I used to do was I would tell my managers, no, I cannot give you, I will not give you an estimate because the cone of uncertainty. So I was shielding myself and, and my thinking about software development behind someone else's authority. Steve McConnell says, cone of uncertainty. therefore, I will not give you an estimate. That's a very... I think it's a very unproductive, uh, unconstructive thing to do. Another question? One, one comment. The cost of fixing a bug, is that the right measure? Is that what we care about? Or is it no. the cost of uh, to the business? What happens? That's an easy question. No, we don't care. We don't care about we don't we especially do not care about the average cost of fixing a defect. <laughs> because what's it, what does it what does it even mean to take an average? Because one bug is going to cost us one minute to fix and maybe 10, uh, 10 cents. Uh, and one bug is going to kill the company. So, and that would be you know, a black swan. What, what do we care the average? That, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to add up all the bugs and divide by the number of bugs. That has, you know, it's a mathematical operation. So yes, in that sense, it. it you can do it with a calculator, but it has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. I, I have in my company the experience where we go to the customer in the production stage, send out a release, and if it takes, if there are a few bugs at the project production stage, and they're going to charge us for every delay. Huh. If they don't achieve, say, five nights availability or some, so we were paying almost per day 30,000 euros till we get to certain we were able to quantify not anything in between, but the one in the production which killed us, our revenues are not coming for the quarter, and each bug we have to pay penalties to the customer. So you might, you might want to ask yourself, is, is the rezoning behind that contract actually based on, on validated experiment? I don't know. But yeah, it's based on the loss the customer is facing, my customer is facing. Okay. But so you may be lucky in that, in that respect, uh, I think uh, one problem that we face, I will close with that, is that many of the contractual assumptions, so many of the hypotheses, if you will, that the contractual relationships, that the very, uh, very uh, stru structuring constraints that we operate under are based on, 
may be leprechauns. And that's, you know, the, to me, that's kind of a big deal. If, if we find out that we were operating under a false assumption, we, we will want to revise the way we do things. I'm going to close with that. I'm going to thank you again. And uh, I'm around if you want to talk about this a little more, but uh, it's time for me to let you go. Thank you. Thank you.